The last time we were here, I was sharing with you about the Jewish prayer shawl, the talit, and the tassels on the talit. It's amazing how this woman in Matthew's Gospel chapter 9 was so taken up by the physical representation of the word of God. In fact, the prayer shawl, the Jewish prayer shawl which is called the talit, is a physical representation of the 613 mitzvahs that are found in the Torah. Mitzvahs is the Hebrew word for commandments. It's spelled M-I-T-E-Z-V-A-H-S, mitzvahs. Now, each letter in the Hebrew letter has a corresponding numerical value. In fact, the numerical value of the five letters of this word, tassel, which is in Hebrew called zitzit, is something that adds up to 600. And if you add the eight strings and five knots of each tassel, the total amounts to 613. So it actually represents the 613 commandments found in the Torah. In a similar vein, if you look at it, the pomegranate, according to the Jewish belief, has 613 pods in it. That's why it's called a holy fruit. In fact, the pomegranate features very, very heavily in the construction of the temple in Jerusalem. In fact, during Solomon's time, pomegranates were a part of the architecture in the temple at Jerusalem. Why? Because it is common belief that there are 613 tiny seed pods in every pomegranate. And the 613 is talking about the different 613 commandments or the do's and the don'ts that are found in the Torah. Now, coming back to what I was sharing with you, here in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 9, is a woman who is having an issue of blood for 12 long years. And she had been to many physicians. The Bible says she didn't find much relief from going to them. But one thing is so prominent. Here is a woman who wouldn't stop. And her desire to be healed was so strong that she wanted to touch the border of Jesus' prayer shawl and to be healed. Like I told you, she must have read Malachi chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. Let me read to you Malachi chapter 4, verses 2 and 3, the last book of the Bible in the Old Testament. And I'd like to read to you about what the scripture tells us. This woman must have been aware of about how the Messiah would be when he did come. The Bible says, But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness referring to the Messiah, arise with healing in his wings. The wings is a reference to the four corners of the prayer shawl. And you shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. And you shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be as ashes under the soles of your feet. In the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, this woman knew this promise. She knew what it was that she could expect from the Messiah. And so, she was willing to get out of the border of her own disease and hopelessness. In fact, she was willing to get out from the end of her border and to move into the edge of his border of healing and hope. Just think about it. The blessing of moving from her border into his border would result in him looking at her and saying, Woman, be of good comfort. Your faith has made you whole. Hallelujah. Now, she had to press out of her comfort zone 
so that the miracle she wanted could happen. That's what I was trying to tell you. Unless you're positioned rightly, the miracle that you desire in life will always elude you. It takes courage, my friends, to be successful. Always remember this. It takes courage to win. Look at any winner. Anyone who has been an achiever in life. That person has had to have tremendous amounts of courage. Why? Because people don't talk about people who don't win. If you win, they're going to talk about you. Many don't like winners. In fact, they don't like anyone who's successful. If you're a successful businessman, they're going to talk about you. If you're a successful preacher, they're going to talk about you. If you're a successful teacher, they're going to talk about you. If you are a mediocre man, average, you will find that mediocre thinking and living and average living has so seeped into the church that the critics of successful believers are so many. That's why you need to have courage to stand there through the storms keep raging and the critics keep talking and you are able to say to them, I have come too far to turn around and through running back home. Uh, the kingdom of God suffereth violence and the violent, that's you, taketh it by force. You are here to take it back by force, my friends. And remember, God loves you. God wants you to be a winner. God wants you to be successful. He doesn't want you buckling under the pressure that people put at you from time to time. He wants you to have the courage to move forward. That takes us to the second transferable truth. Now that you're positioned, the second truth that I'd like to share from this particular text in Joshua chapter 2 is called exposure. The power of exposure is clearly defined in the second chapter of the book of Joshua. In fact, the reason why Joshua sends spies over to the promised land, though he had been there earlier, is to expose the next generation to what he's already seen. Even in Exodus chapter 13 verse 14, it was highlighted by God to Moses that when the children asked the parents in time to come, what are all these things that is happening? It was the responsibility of parents to speak to the children and share with them about the grand things that God had done. So here was Joshua. He was wanting the next generation to be exposed to what he already knew. And he knew this truth. He knew that his children would never be excited about what he was excited about unless you expose them to what he had known and seen. And that's what he was trying to do really. He was trying to expose the next generation. Remember the two spies belonged to the next generation. They weren't in the same age group as Caleb and himself. They were the next generation spies. So we're talking about these two men who represented a new generation. And Joshua was exposing them to what he had seen. In fact, this is a year in which God is leading into a season of exposure. Now let me explain to you what I mean by season of exposure. Exposure is going to come in an unparalleled fashion in your life. In fact, it's going to happen beyond the demographics of your environment, your friends, and your comfort zone. Think about it. God is going or already has just put you in some strange places and he's exposing you to some new things, giving you new favor to handle them. This is something you have never experienced earlier in life. And he is actually creating in you a desire for the next season that is coming into your life. In fact, he is just exposing you to what he is about to begin to start doing in your life. Joshua knew that he cannot work with people who have not been exposed to the level of his exposure. In fact, he either had to bring them up or let them die in the wilderness. It may sound strange to you this morning when you are hearing these words. 
But let me explain it to you so you will understand what I am trying to say. Whenever I preach or teach, I expect that you who hear me will not have any ambiguity in your minds. And to remove all ambiguity, it's good for me to be clear in what I am trying to explain to you. When I said it was the duty of Joshua either to bring them out, out of the wilderness or let them die in the wilderness, there's something that very often Christian believers fail to understand. Joshua and Caleb had to endure 40 years in the wilderness for no crime of theirs. In fact, it was the vast majority of Israel who were in unbelief. They believed the ten spies. They believed the bad report that the ten spies brought about the land of Canaan or the land of promise. Because this series of teachings are titled Dwelling in the Land of Promise. I want you to pay attention to what I'm saying. Joshua and Caleb had no problem with what they saw, with what they had heard God speak to Moses and they had no problem at all about the Anakims in the land or the giants who were living in the land. They were not intimidated one bit. In fact, they were ready to go in and take possession of their inheritance. But because of the children of Israel, because of the unbelief in the people of Israel, these two faith men, Caleb and Joshua were made to endure wilderness living for 40 long years. Some of you get tired of waiting six months. Some of you get exasperated waiting two years. Well, how will it be, be honest, how will it be if you were made to wait for no reason of yours? For no crime of yours. You are made to wait. That's what was happening to Joshua as well as to Caleb. And Joshua had waited so long that he knew that either these people were going to come up higher and get the same vision or they were going to get out of his way because he had come to the place where he knew within three days he was going to cross the Jordan and he was going to enter into the land of promise. In fact, he had waited so long for something like this to happen. 40 long years. When you read the Bible, there's an incident mentioned in 2 Kings chapter 2 and verse 10 of how we see an aging prophet about to leave the world. A time has come for him to move on and here is a young prophet walking along with him desirous of having a double portion of the anointing that rested on the senior prophet. We are talking about Elijah and Elisha. Elijah is about to leave the world and Elisha knows in his heart that his mentor is about to leave but there is a deep desire on the inside of him a very very deep desire on him to have a double portion of the anointing of Elijah's to come and rest upon him. In fact, if you read this portion of scripture, it says in 2 Kings chapter 2 and verses 15 to 18, you see Elisha is told by Elijah, if you see me when I'm taken up, you can have a double portion of my spirit. In fact, one translation, I'm told, reads like this. If you see what I see, you can have a double portion of my spirit. In fact, every new season demands a new anointing. Every passing season makes way for a new anointing that comes in, that brings about the power and presence of God. Elisha knew it. But Elisha was told by Elijah a key to receiving the new fresh anointing or the fresh empowerment or a double portion of what empowerment Elisha was coveting wouldn't happen if he didn't see what his mentor saw. He had to see what Elijah saw. In other words, you can't get 
what I got if you don't see what I see. That's what Elijah was saying in a nutshell. God is exposing you out of your comfort zone, away from what you're used to, away from your circle of friends. In fact, he's putting you in an environment that you're going to feel uncomfortable and you're not going to feel that you really fit. You may have to learn again. You may have to unlearn a lot of things again. You may have to read again. You may have to pray a little bit more. But you must understand God is exposing you to something new. And he knows that unless you are exposed to what he sees, you will not enjoy the blessing of having what he sees. So you've been positioned. Like I told you earlier, the harlot's house was on the walls of Jericho. In fact, it was as close as to the edge as it could be. One foot further and not only were they out, she was also out. Likewise, you are positioned on the edge. One more foot, one more step, in fact one more push or one more and your eyes have not seen nor your ears heard neither has entered into your heart the things that God has in store for them that love him but it has been revealed unto us by his spirit in other words he said you can't even imagine what I am trying to get to you but I am revealing it in your spirit before you get it into your life. In fact, that's the crux of 3 John 2. 3 John 2 is a beautiful verse. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in good health, even as thy soul prospers. In other words, you are going to get it into your spirit before you get it into your lives. You are going to get it into your spirit before you get it into your paychecks. You are going to get it into your spirit before you get it into the ministry. You are going to get it into your spirit before you get it into your homes. You are going to get it into your spirit before you get it into your body. And your body begins to respond to God's word. But you first have to get it into your spirit. Oh, hallelujah. You are free in your spirit, my friends. First, before you are free in your life. You're blessed on the inside before you're blessed on the outside. What you're feeling stirred up in your belly is a preview of what God is about to do in your life. Believe me, God has grand things in store for you this entire 2017. So you've been positioned. Number three, the third transferable truth from this text from Joshua chapter 2 is the word courage. Courage. You got to have courage, my friends, if you're going to do anything worthwhile in life. Rahab was a harlot. There is no doubt about it. Hers was not a profession of great value. Hers was not a profession that was honorable. But you can't doubt the fact that Rahab was a woman of courage. She had great courage. In fact, the courage she had was so strong that she was able to withstand the king of Jericho at the risk of her own life. Think about it. Would you dare to do what she did? Would you even care to think for one moment that you would be a recipient of the entire opposition of a city just because you harbored two strangers whom you had never seen earlier and you don't know anything about them? But she had a courage to take a stand for what she believed. My friends, this woman inspires me. Why? Because Rahab, she had the courage to hide the spies at the risk of losing her life. That means she wasn't frightened of her life. Do you have the courage to act outwardly on what you see inwardly? Remember, it's up to you whether you will be a dreamer who dies on the edge of the promised land or you will be an inhabitant who will move across the Jordan and enter into the promised land and live in the promised land as a possessor of the promises of God. Only you can decide that. It takes courage to be successful. Misery will always have company. If you don't want to make waves, 
the common thinking is be mediocre, fit in. If you are more concerned about people than of God, then neutralize everything he put in you and just fit in with the crowd and conform to world thinking. Conform to the world, conform to people. It's so easy to neutralize the best things God has placed in your life when you live a mediocre life, an average life. Remember, the word average is a killer of destinies. Mediocre is a killer of destinies. Most people don't realize it. They think it is part of humility to say I'm mediocre, I'm average, I'm just an ordinary person. But the Bible doesn't call us with those words. The Bible says you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar person. You're a peculiar person. Whether you like it or not, that's how God views you and that's how he calls you, a peculiar person. A person who's been brought out of darkness into his marvelous light that you may show forth his praises. Hallelujah. That's a noble cause to live for. Therefore, it takes courage, my friends, to be different. It takes courage to go where you have never gone before. It takes courage even to come to this place where you have come to in life, where you are prepared to move forward, where you are prepared for change, where you are prepared for the new season that God has in store for you. You don't want to live in the wilderness any longer. You are tired of wilderness living. You are tired of those prayers you have prayed, Lord, send manna from heaven. You are tired of it. You don't need manna any longer, my friends. That's the good news. You can have the bread of life. The good news is you can have the miraculous happen in your life as you sow seeds and believe for the God of harvest. Remember, God is called the God of the harvest to give you the harvest in due time. Remember, it takes courage to be exceptional. It takes courage to be wise. It takes courage to be knowledgeable. It takes courage to break free from normalcy and to go after your dream and to go after God. Remember you need courage my friends. Courage cannot be taught in church. Courage cannot be taught to anybody. Courage has to spring up from the inside of you. You either have it or you don't have it. But if you trust God and you're willing to make the transition and you're willing to take the risk that comes from letting your faith dictate to you over your feelings and over the sensations that you feel overwhelming you, let me tell you this, God will honor your faith and your faith will see you through. The Bible says the just shall live by his faith. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's the truth. The just shall live by his faith. You are a righteous man in Christ. God promises you that he will stand with you. And he will not disappoint your faith. Your faith will never be put to shame. Don't ever sit and think that if I express my faith in God, will God let me down? God never lets down anyone who walks by faith. Because God is a faith God. He's called faithful. That's his nature. That's his character. And that's how he wants you to be really. He wants you to walk by faith. He wants you to walk not by sight or by feelings. But by the very nature that is invested into you. Remember you have been made a partaker of his divine nature. That means you have the nature of faithfulness already implanted in you. The DNA of God is in you the moment you accept Jesus into your life. You're a different man. You're a different person. No wonder the people around you don't understand you fully. You can't expect them to understand everything about you. Why? Because the nature of God is in you. And they don't understand the nature of God. The nature of God is to be faithful. The nature of God is to be holy. The nature of God is to be loving. The nature of God is to be compassionate. The nature of God is to be merciful. And that's what is invested in you. Hallelujah. You are a partaker of his divine nature. Number four. The fourth transferable truth from this text in Joshua chapter 2 is knowledge. Knowledge. When I talk about knowledge... I am going to explain to you a little bit in depth what I mean by knowledge. Knowledge is not just what you read or learn from books. We are going to learn more about it when we come back to this God willing the next time we meet. It's going to surprise you 
what we understand by knowledge. We are going to see that the things that God does in our lives are always things that produces good things. Because God is good, he works in such a way that good things are produced in our life. When you read the book of Proverbs, the book of Proverbs says the root of the righteous produces good fruit. God wants good fruit in your life, my friends. And I'm going to pray with you this morning. I'm privileged that you are entertaining me in your homes. And you have invited me into your homes this morning. I long to join my faith with yours. To pray and to believe for miracles to happen in your life. Why don't we do it? Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, as we release our faith to you, we come into the spirit of agreement for miracles, signs and wonders. We are in agreement that you will do mighty things in the life of your loved ones. And you will reach out to them and touch them in a supernatural way. In the mighty name of Jesus, let there be a supernatural covering, protection around them, O oh Father. Right through this day and right through the days ahead and right through this year, let there be a supernatural covering that will envelop them. That every day is filled with fruitfulness and good things manifesting out of the good root that is in them. I commit them into your hands. Your hands are good hands. They will never fail them. They will never forsake them. You will always uphold them with the right hand of your righteousness. So let it be. In the mighty name of Jesus for your glory. I bless them in your name. Let them be blessed from the crown of their head to the soles of their feet. And let that blessing move into every area of their life. So that they will be a blessing on the face of this earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and Amen. Hallelujah. My friends, God is a good God. And you are truly blessed. Remember, one word from God is the divine game changer in your destiny. You are blessed of the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. Amen. What I'm teaching is being put out for you on a DVD. And it's an audio DVD. At the same time, we also bring out a monthly newsletter called The Pulpit. It's brought out in English as well as in Tamil and in Telugu. If you would like to have a copy of this, this is sent free of charge to anybody who requests for it. The address is on the screen. You can write to us, but you must make sure that you give us your complete postal address along with your telephone number, your contact mobile number. And we'll mail it to you free of charge, first class, postpaid. There's no charge at all for it and there's no obligation for any free material you receive from us. You are not entitled or required in any way to support us if you don't feel like you'd like to support us. But if you like the word of God, the word is for you. After all, Jesus said, freely you have received, freely give. And that's our aim. We want to give you the word of God as much as possible. So the word profits you and you become a fruit-bearing wine in the hands of God.